Good morning. Good morning. I invite you to take a deep breath. Imagine all that is above you is a starlit night. And in this moment, all is calm, all is bright. We continue to experience and explore this holy season of preparation. I invite you to sing just the first four words, Silent Night, Holy Night, with me. Each week of Advent, our worship series will explore the images in each verse of this beloved carol as we draw closer and closer to our service of light on Christmas Eve. The shepherds got quite the wake-up call that night when the sky lit up like a Christmas tree, so to speak, with the glory of the angels streaming all around. transformative glory of what God can do in our lives. This awe, this wonder is the focus of this week. Not just the shepherds before the angels. Glories are streaming every day if we only have eyes to see. How would our lives be renewed if we saw the world and our lives through a lens of awe and wonder. Silent night, holy night. It was the night when joy was born, and just as now the world was torn, but all was calm and all was bright, the star above gave out its light. Silent night, holy night. We continue this season of waiting by lighting the second candle, vowing to notice and respond to the grandeur of God revealed in things large and small. We remember the shepherd's response, acknowledging our own led tendencies to fear, our own longing for joy. Shepherds quake at the sight. Glorious streams, heaven at afar, heavenly host sing, Alleluia. Would you join? Wondrous God. We open ourselves to hear your call today to become those who not only see the joy all around us, but can also be joy and bring joy to all around us in our lives, our families, our community, and our world. Our Advent journey is underway. We prepare ourselves to celebrate Christ's birth anew. So let your joy shine in the night and let your light burn warm and bright. Silent night, holy night. This joy we give the world is balm, and in this truth we find our calm.
now I invite you to stand and join in our opening hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It's number 240 in the hymnal. All the nations you have made shall come to bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love towards me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol.
in that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. Please stand and sing for the antiphon. who came forth from the mouth of the Most High, reaching from end to end and ordering all things mightily and sweetly. Come and teach us the way of prudence. Please remain standing and join in our hymn of preparation, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
You may be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Creator, Sustainer, and Redeemer. Amen. <coughs> Glory stream from heaven afar, heavenly host, sing Alleluia. Part of the second verse of the beloved hymn, Silent Night. We think about that night of the heavenly host. We think about the Christmas story and the seasons of the Christian year. One of the things I appreciate about our calendar is how often we get a chance to start again. Advent begins the Christmas calendar, and then the secular calendar brings us New Year's, and we make resolutions and start again. And then most of us fail over a few weeks, and then Lent comes, and we get to repent for our failures and start again. Over and over, each day, we have an opportunity to see God's creation anew, to see ourselves in God's sight anew, and to make a new start. And so as we enter into this season, as we begin the sermon today, I want us to think about the beginning. Genesis tells us that in the beginning, the earth was a formless void and a wind from God. Ruah. The Spirit hovers over the void. John 1 tells us that the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have in these traditions, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God revealed in three persons in the beginning. In Genesis, the first thing God does, moving with the Spirit, speaking through the reason, the wisdom, the word, the logos in Greek, the first thing God does is say, let there be light. And there is light. And God separates the light from the darkness, and it is good. I preached before about how our, junior, our Jewish ancestors saw that God created intentionally, lovingly. That this understanding of creation is a rebuke to nearly every other tradition of their time. How we see God matters. God said, let there be light. Our antiphon today comes from a spoken tradition around the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, God with us. In this verse, the antiphon is, O wisdom who came forth from the mouth of the Most High, ordering all things mightily and sweetly, God brings order out of chaos, mightily, sweetly, for good. A couple weeks ago, I told you about a 14th century mystic named Julian of Norwich. And many of her visions are quite gruesome. Christ suffering on the cross. The blood of atonement of God suffering with us. But one in particular stands out to me. She's having this conversation. She realizes she's holding something small, fragile, like a hazelnut. She asks God what it is, and God says it's everything that has been created, everything that will be created. It's all that is. And Julian asks, how can it exist at all? It's so small and fragile. And Christ says, it exists because I love it. We gather this Sunday morning in Fort Scott, Kansas, in the middle of the United States of America, in the northern hemisphere, North America, one of the seven continents on a small blue marble that orbits a small sun in a far reach of the Milky Way. Why do we exist at all? Because God creates. God wills us to be. All of our differences, our different 
tribes and political identities and nationalities and borders and fences and seen from this vantage point nearly every person that's ever had the opportunity to go into space to orbit the moon or even just get into Earth's atmosphere and look down at this small blue globe has just been overcome by awe. The great scientist Albert Einstein is quoted as saying there are two ways to live life as if nothing is miraculous or as if everything is. Do we look on creation with a sense of awe and wonder? Do we look at ourselves with a sense of awe and wonder? In the Psalms, our Jewish ancestors write about the full range of human emotions and they express hopes beyond what we can achieve. And one of the recurring ones we hear today in Psalm 86, all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. This hope doesn't say they'll all become exactly like us, even though we think we have the right answers. It says all the nations you have created and all of the diversity that you have created, ultimately, we will gather, we will worship. It's the vision of the Old Testament, it's the vision of the New Testament, that eventually our differences are not eliminated, but they are overcome. We gather in awe and wonder before our Creator. We see God's creation, God's diversity, through God's eyes, light and darkness. Martin Luther King is quoted as saying that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only light can drive out darkness. Only love can drive out hate. How do we see the world? How do we respond to conflict? Rooted and grounded in love. How do we act in the world as Christ followers? How do we become like Christ in this broken and divided world that Emmanuel enters into? Born of a woman on the edges of an empire place with no power or authority. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God, the psalmist writes. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. One of the things I am most aware of is that I have a divided heart. But sometimes I'm really focused and dedicated and faithful and sometimes I'm not. I let other things get in the way. I wrestle with what it means to be loving, with what I can do and what I can't do. When what I can do is clearly not enough, but all too often that becomes an excuse not to do anything. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. As we gather this second Sunday of Advent, I began by inviting you to take a deep breath and picture yourself under a sunlit sky under a starlit sky. Picture yourself again as a shepherd in the hills and mountains around Jerusalem, not far from the town of Bethlehem, the place the great King David was born, the place David's great-great-grandmother had returned to the land of bread, the house of bread, a 
place of God's abundance. The sun is setting. You guide your flocks to the meadow. It's incredibly dark. And you are among the lowest of the low. You are shepherds. You don't get to go home to the town, to a house, to shelter. While you raise the animals that are offered in sacrifice at the temple, you are not invited to the temple. For you are ritually unclean. You are outsiders. When suddenly the sky lights up brighter than day, Not surprisingly, I think my reaction would have been fear. Luke's gospel tells us they were terrified. Utterly incapable of rational thought. Fear is a disabling condition. Left to fester, fear divides us and causes us to draw hard lines and behave in most unchristlike ways. But it's also a natural reaction, a protective reaction, to sense danger, to fight or flee. But the message to the shepherds is not to be afraid. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined, the prophet Isaiah promised. God has already accomplished this thing that we are still hoping for. The light is breaking into the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome it. In the New Testament, one of the last letters written, the author of 1 John says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not yet reached perfection in love. The Bible is full of calls to fear. But our translation is lacking. The Bible is full of calls to awe and wonder, not terror. Do not be afraid, the messenger says. The shepherd's world has been transformed. It is lit up. Do not be afraid. One of the most common phrases in Scripture is, do not be afraid. Fear not. Awe, wonder, yes, but not fear. Because you exist because God loves you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. Joy. I had the privilege this week of leading some small groups in Lectio Divina. And we listened to that passage from Luke. And one of the things that hit me over and over as I listen deeply to that passage with different groups highlighting different phrases is how rapidly the emotional world of the shepherds is transformed. They are outcasts, they are workers, they are terrified. Something new is happening for all people. And within moments, they are boldly saying, let us go to see this thing that has been happened that the Lord has told us about. They understand these messengers are God speaking to them. Glory to God in the highest, the angels sing. Glory to God in the highest, the shepherds sing. They are caught up in it. They are no longer afraid. They too now are messengers of what they have seen and been told. They are now living in light, in hope. God keeps God's promises. 
the Messiah has come. This will be a sign to you, they say. You will find a baby. A baby. God comes in weakness, in dependence, in Bethlehem. Let us go and see this thing that the Lord has told us about. And all is calm, and all is bright. And the shepherds go and they journey and they find the stable. They find the child wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And they tell everyone they see all that they have seen and heard and everyone is amazed. They are filled with awe and wonder. But Mary treasured these words and pondered them in her heart. See, Mary's already been told what's happening. Next week we'll talk a bit about the Annunciation couple of weeks we'll read through the Magnificat, Mary's song of praise for God, for what God has already done, for what she is willingly participating in. And yet, as she goes through pregnancy, as she gives birth, as she has this helpless child, what must it be like to have shepherds show up from the fields telling the same story? of who this child is. How overwhelmed she must be. She treasures these words and continues to ponder them in her heart. I think this season's what it's really about for us is to treasure these words, to ponder them in our heart, in our mind, to be willing to live in a constant state of awe and wonder because of what the Lord has told us, what the Lord has done for us. To recognize the light that is coming into the world. To take that light in, to share it with others. In the New Testament, the author of Hebrews writes, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created all things, created the world's. He is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. The Logos, the reason, the will of God made flesh, dwelling among us, teaching us his way, showing us what it is to be fully human and God-centered. Paul writes to the Philippians, who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God knows what it is to be human, to be tempted, to hunger and thirst, to cry, to laugh, to lose loved ones, to mourn, to be weary, to be uncertain, to pray earnestly. God knows what it is to glorify to live a human life in a way that shares light and love, that overcomes evil with good. Glory's stream from heaven above is not just about a message on a particular night. It's about recognizing God's presence among us. It's about responding to that presence, becoming the body of Christ, not as a place of privilege for ourselves, but of service to the world. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Christ be our light. May Christ be at the center of all that we do. 
May we overcome darkness with light. May we overcome hatred with love. One of Martin Luther King's mentors, a man named Reverend Howard Thurman, wrote a wonderful series of prose and poem called The Work of Christmas that we will draw from again. Today I want to share with you this passage. There is more to life than we previously imagined. Angels hide in every nook and cranny. Magi masquerade as everyday people and shepherds wear the garments of day laborers. The whole earth is brimming with glory for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. Glory stream from heaven above. Let us join the heavenly host. Live our lives in such a way that we proclaim hallelujah. May it be so. Amen. I invite you to join in our hymn of response. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. It's number 89 in the red hymn. There are a number of announcements in the bulletin. I want to remind you about the special charge conference to vote on the BSA settlement tomorrow. There'll be an email coming out tomorrow with some more details. Uh, the Great Plains Conference and the Council of Bishop are urging those of us who gather to vote no on that settlement. And I will explain some more in the email and uh, charge conference tomorrow night. Uh, it has to do with a longstanding promise to indemnify charter organizations and uh, United Methodist Churches are among the largest number of charter organizations, along with the Lions Club, I think is second. And when BSA uh, filed for bankruptcy, they did not honor that long-standing promise. 
They are still negotiating. There is still a chance that that may change. And the Conference of Bishops is asking us to vote no to help further those negotiations. So if you have questions about that, uh, let me know. And I can share some information with you that uh, they've been sending out. And those of you who are interested enough to come and hear more and vote tomorrow, we will uh, gather at 7 o'clock for, do I have that right? It's in the, in the bulletin. So I, I think it's 6 o'clock. Seven, okay. I've got myself confused. I have too many things on my calendar and didn't want to get it wrong. So seven o'clock as printed in the bulletin and we will have that. I am hoping that it will be a very short meeting. It just depends on who comes and who wants to talk about what, but uh, it may be just a few minutes, I would hope. So, uh, There are other bulletin announcements. Uh, the uh, Hawk Rock Committee is encouraging us to uh, take and fo post uh, Christmas photos on Facebook. Uh, near the tree or with the poinsettias or wherever you'd like to do that and we will share our celebration that way. Uh, you can sponsor one of the poinsettias. There's a form in the bulletin if you want to dedicate one of them to honor or remember a loved one. You have the ways to do that. And um, I have one uh, announcement in the basket. Uh, we are asked to hold in prayer Don Bernard uh, advanced stages of prostate cancer. So if we would hold Don and his loved ones in our family, in our prayers. Uh, Don and all would appreciate that. Let us take all of our joys and concerns to God who knows us in prayer. Holy and gracious God, in this season of Advent, we prepare ourselves. You give us a new opportunity to live in awe and wonder, to recognize your messengers, your glory all around us. The earth is charged with the grandeur of God. And we are called to recognize and respond, to know that we are held in the palm of the divine hand in life, in death, in times of great happiness and great sorrow, that we might live in joy, that we might experience and share your peace, that we might live in hope because we experience and share your love. We pray for those who hunger and thirst, who wait for justice, who battle health concerns, who mourn, who serve and seek to heal or protect. We pray for ourselves that we might be light in the midst of someone else's darkness. We pray all these things with the confidence of the children of God as we continue in prayer with the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As we prepare for our offertory, I want to share a conversation I had yesterday with a member from a former church who God has gotten a hold of. He is now actually serving as a district, uh, super, or a district superintendent appointment to a small rural church. And so he's preaching every Sunday, just like his former pastor did. And he called me and he said, I got to tell you a story. See, you got me hooked on that moment of the Lord's Prayer. It is a gift as a pastor to say the Lord's Prayer with a congregation. Because we start off and then you pick it up and it just rolls over us. One of the things I'm aware of is one of the slides I often fail to advance is that second slide on the Lord's Prayer because I'm in the moment. Like, oh yeah, I've got a job to do. And he was telling me he's wearing a headset mic and he didn't realize it because he wanted to step back. and He was still the loudest voice in the room and it just wasn't quite the same for him. But small things that we do, 
can have a big impact. When our prayers join together, it rolls over the world. It transforms the world. Our small amounts of giving join together, create hope and light for others. All of the ministries that we do as First UMC are made possible by those who give to the offertory. I invite you to reflect on all the gifts that God has given you, those moments of awe and wonder, and how we respond. Let us hear our offertory. I invite you to join in the prayer of dedication. Holy One, this Advent season, we wait in joy, we give with joy. Joy for all you have given us, joy because of your sacred promises. Joy for the life and ministry of Jesus, who we are called to follow in humility. In Christ's name, inspire us to generosity, receive our offerings, and use them to spread your joy in our world. Amen. Our closing hymn is the chorus to We Need a Silent Night in Here. God is with us. God knows what it is to be human. God knows what we need. And God knows what we have to give. Let us go forth and be the people of God in this time and place. Amen. <laughs>